Okay. Now I have my coffee and I'm inside out of the snow that's falling outside. And uh, waiting for my listeners to arrive. I'll be talking about this wonderful book that my older and smarter brother bought for me many years ago, America BC by Barry Fell. And I read that edition and then this second edition revised came out. I haven't gone through the revised edition yet, but let's see. Barry Fell was a Harvard professor whose specialty was invertebrate zoology. Let's see. Um, I'm reading an article in Bad Archaeology. So let's see if I can drop the link into our chat room. Yeah, coffee, cigarettes, and snow are almost perfect, but where's my chocolate? I'm sure I have some chocolate. Okay, there's your link to the article. It was not just uh, some fly-by-night, a Harvard professor. He studied starfish and things like that. But, okay, a marine biologist from Harvard. He was actually born in England, and his name was Howard Baraclofell. Born 1917, died 1994. He's most famous for this book, um, America BC. This is the first edition, probably the millionth printing. <coughs> oh, and this says this one is newly, re newly revised and updated. Copyright 1976 and 1989, but this one is even more um, more revised and more updated. It's the 2001 edition, so it was done after his death, and just by flipping through the pages. I can tell that it, it's slightly different. I think primarily in the uh, images, the, the photos and diagrams. Anyway, it's a marvelous book. And what really interested my older and smarter brother, Steve, was that Phil shows you examples of ancient writing, their alphabets, their uh, symbols, and gives, I guess you'd call them translations of writing plus transliteration of their alphabets. Hang on, I found my chocolate. Oh, I'll go ahead and show you. It's a Hershey bar. It took some getting used to when they switched from corn syrup to sugar in their chocolate, but it is far better this way. Sugar instead of corn syrup. Okay, let's get to... I love this. Steve even got a cold laminating plastic and, and protected the cover of this book for me. 
Bell's thesis is that Europeans and Africans and others came to the Americas long before Columbus and even before the Vikings. Now let's see. Let's find you a good picture. Here's some neat stuff. We have the elephant that supports the earth. And uh, wow. The elephant that supports the earth is on my right. It has a picture of the sun and the elephant and some writing. And it's translated as the elephant that supports the earth upon the waters and causes it to quake. So reads the Libyan inscription on this votive tablet found at Cuenca, Ecuador. Libya, of course, is in North Africa, near Egypt. It's been in the news lately. Um, the Libyan script in the finest style, matching that of King Massinissa's monument at Thuga, Tunisia, dates to the latter half of the third century before Christ. The letters read from left to right and from above downwards. And let's see, there's more. It uses both Libyan, it uses Libyan words and some of them are also Egyptian words. Now this one, this drawing on my left is, what is it? A crew of the Shishank, the king took shelter of concealment. That's Ogham, by the way, which we think of as an Irish script. Uh, so read the Libyan inscriptions found by Forrest Kirkland, painted under a rock overhang of the Rio Grande cliffs in Texas. The two, <coughs> sorry, the two, two Ogham lines to the left read, <coughs> sorry, DG took shelter and ZDH, hidden place. The Libyan letters read, left to right, crew of the Shishank king. Several kings of this name ruled Libya and Egypt between 1000 and 800 BC, an era when North African voyagers began to explore the new world. Inscriptions such as this show that the Libyans made use of both the our own native Numidian alphabets in writing the Libyan language. And folks, you know that when you go to school, they tell you that, okay, maybe some Vikings came over to the Americas before Columbus, but they didn't stay long. They uh, just kind of cruised the coastline and went on their merry way. Well, um, let's do another quick search for Eric Red, father of Leif Erikson. These are our Viking friends. Oh, it's Eric with a K. I always do a C just automatically. Eric the Red. I don't want to resort to Wikipedia. 
Okay. Um, Biography.com or Exploration Mariners Museum. Let's go with the Exploration Mariners Museum. Come on, let's get you the link. I'm glad someone's in chat and talking to me. It, it makes this better. What, the schools don't mention the Vikings anymore? They did kind of mention them, at least in Iceland and Greenland when I was in school. Okay, Eric the Red, the first European to land on and settle in Greenland. Which, of course, isn't part of North America. But he did this in the spring of 982. And, of course, uh, it was 500 years before Columbus went to uh, the Caribbean in 1492. Little over 500 years. But it doesn't say he went to the Americas. Of course not, because somebody's pet theory on which he based his whole academic career depends upon Columbus being the first. And yet, the natives, the people who actually live here in the Americas, have all kinds of stories of people who don't look like them and don't speak their language coming to visit, to plunder and pillage, to trade, to um, kidnap slaves, you name it, and some to actually settle down. And by the way, the Iroquois, the some say Iroquois, but it's a French word and it doesn't have to make sense, it's French. The Iroquois were hated and feared by the other tribes. They were considered invaders from some other place. And the Iroquois were cannibals. They ate people and they didn't even bother to kill them first. They would cut off a prisoner's hand and take turns drinking the blood that spurted out from the stump. So I'm not really impressed with the Iroquois League and their system of laws and such. They were scum. Well, anyway, let's get back to Barry Fell. The American Enigma and its Solution, Chapter 1. Come on, I can't get to the first page. I had to knock off the spider webs and cat hair from the edges of this book. I really need to clear out this house and fumigate it and clean the living daylights out of it. Two centuries of independence, 200 years of national awareness. Now remember this, he was writing around 1976 the bicentennial of the United States of America. These are the underlying themes of countless festivities now in progress or planned throughout 50 American states. The world at large passes, oh, pauses a moment to reflect upon the prodigy that grew from the 13 rebellious colonies when George III lost his American domains. But wait a bit, there is more to America's past than appears upon the surface. A strange unrest is apparent among many of the younger historians and archaeologists of the colleges and universities a sense that somehow a very large slice of America's past has mysteriously vanished from our public records. For how else can we explain the ever-swelling tally of puzzling ancient inscriptions, 
now being reported from nearly all parts of the United States, Canada, and Latin America. The inscriptions are written in various European and Mediterranean languages in alphabets that date from 2,500 years ago, and they speak not only of visits by ancient ships, but also of permanent colonies of Celts, Basques, Libyans, and even Egyptians. They occur on buried temples, on tablets, and on gravestones, and on cliff faces. From some of them, we infer that the colonists intermarried with the Amerindians, and so their descendants still live here today. Uh, well, that seems logical, but of course, if you're... Um, if you're uh, an entrenched academic in the world of the university, you aren't going to go for it. It upsets your apple cart. And let's see, yes, Pacific Northwest tribes enslaved other tribes they would feud with. Yeah. Oh, by the way, no disrespect to the Lakota. Dakota Sioux and Dakota Sioux, but they originally were invaders who were quite brutal to their um, conquered peoples. They came, I think, originally from the area of the Great Lakes. But that's another story. Now, of course, recent DNA analysis shows that 80% of, not the people, but the DNA in Native people is Siberian. They determined that by comparing it with DNA from ancient Siberians. 20% appears to be a European haplo group. Now, that doesn't mean that 20% of the people are European, but it does mean that 20% of the DNA is European. And I'm wondering about the Micmac. Let's see if I can spell it right. Half Irish, half black. Well, that isn't right. There's a tribe. Um, maybe I've, I'm remembering its name wrong. Micmac tribe. A First Nations people that places them in Canada, because we call them Native American, indigenous to Canada's Atlantic provinces, well, they actually appear to be white Europeans. And yet an important Algonquian tribe that occupied Nova Scotia. Well, let's check out the Cherokee, since I have at least as much Cherokee blood as, uh, what's her name, the politician, Pocahontas. They, the Cherokee are mainly in Oklahoma now, but I think they started out in the Carolinas. Many of them, well, I'm not getting much here on the web. But many Cherokee fled to Florida and became known as Seminoles. So Osceola, who was a war chief of the Seminoles, was Cherokee. And uh, I think he's the, is he the guy who developed writing for the Cherokee for the Seminoles, the talking leaves. 
Osceola named Billy Powell at birth in Alabama became an influential leader of the Seminole people of Florida. His parentage includes Creek, Scottish, African American, and English. Well, anyway, the people of the Seminole tribe were at least half Cherokee, people fleeing from the white settlers wanted to take them to reservations or just outright kill them. All right, yes, old Spangler in the chat is pointing out that <coughs> the phenotypes of North American tribes and indigenous South Americans are quite different. He, he points out that the people of the North are more European and the South more Asiatic. Maybe. I kind of wonder. Because many of the native oral traditions say that they started here in the Americas and they migrated to Siberia, not from it. Siberia. Of course, the academics never believe what these primitive savage natives tell them. They couldn't possibly know their own history, could they? No, it's a bunch of fairy tales. By the way, the word myth, M-Y-T-H, does not mean fiction. Myth is a story that includes supernatural beings, deities, gods. And then there's the legend. A legend is a story that does not have gods in it. But that doesn't mean that legends are not true. <coughs> Sorry, it's morning. I have to cough. Every dang morning, especially when I've been shut in like this due to the weather, the air gets bad <coughs> in the house and I have cats. Well, anyway, these people have preserved their history in some cases with uh, pictographs, you know, uh, pictures on the rocks in some cases with oral traditions. And they say they started here in the Americas and migrated to Siberia. So of course they share DNA with the Siberians. Okay, I'm going to skip a ways to Uh, about 3,000 years ago, bands of roving Celtic mariners crossed the North Atlantic to discover and then to colonize North America. They came from Spain and Portugal by way of the Canary Islands, sailing the trade winds as Columbus also was to do long afterward. The advantage of this route is that the winds favor a crossing from east to west, but for Celts accustomed to a temperate climate, it had one, the one drawback that it led them to the tropical West Indies. No place for northerners, so although their landfall lay in the Caribbean, it was on the rocky coasts and mountainous hinder hinterlands of New England that most of these wanderers finally landed there to establish a new European kingdom which they called Iargalon. I-A-R-G-A-L-O-N. Land beyond the sunset. They built villages and temples, raised druid circles, and buried their dead in marked graves. 
They were still there in the time of Julius Caesar, as is attested by an inscribed monolith on which the date of celebration of the great Celtic festival of Beltane, May Day, is given in Roman numerals appropriate to the reformed Julian calendar introduced in 46 BC. Now, the whole of the book gives evidence for these assertions. But in any case, if they didn't land here and didn't made, make those inscriptions, what's going on? Well, farmers in New England for decades have found Ogham, that strange Celtic writing made of lines, vertical lines and sometimes lines going across them like a crosshatch. And of course the academics dismiss them as plow marks, but you can actually make out words on the best examples. And of course, anytime there's something really definitive in the way of evidence, I'm not saying proof. Proof doesn't establish fact. Proof or proven to prove just means you've tested your hypothesis. And it passed the test, but that doesn't mean that it's true. It just means it's likely. There's all kinds of rock writing. Some of it's Ogham, some of it's other alphabets, some of it is pictures, pictographs. Okay, in the wake of the Celtic pioneers came the Phoenician traders of Spain, men from Cadiz who spoke the Punic tongue, but wrote it in the peculiar style of lettering known as Iberian script. Phoenicians... Uh, were the people who founded Carthage. They came from what we call Palestine, but their huge thriving colony in North Africa at Carthage <laughs> is most famous because of the wars with Rome. And the Romans called them puni, P-U-N-I, and from that word we get our words punish, punish, punishment, punitive. Carthage was seriously punished. It was burned to the ground when the Romans finally won. Well, anyway, here's a Phoenician Punic language written in Iberian script. In other words, Spain and Portugal, Iberian. Although some of these traders seem to have settled only on the coast, only temporarily, leaving a few engraved stones to mark their visits or record themes of territorial annexation, other Phoenicians remained here and together with Egyptian miners, became part of the Wabanaki tribe of New England. Further south, Basque sailors came to Pennsylvania and established a temporary settlement there, leaving, however, no substantial monuments other than grave markers bearing their names. Further south still, Libyan and Egyptian mariners entered the Mississippi from the Gulf of Mexico, penetrating inland to Iowa and the Dakotas and westward along the Arkansas rivers to leave behind inscribed records of their presence. Norse and Basque visitors reached the Gulf of St. Lawrence, introducing various mariners' terms into the language of the northern Algonquian Indians. 
Descendants of these visitors are also to be found apparently among the Amerindian tribes, several of which employ dialects derived in part from the ancient tongues of Phoenicia and North Africa. And it, this is just the first chapter, but here we find evidence all over the inner contents of the book. For example, uh, an alphabet found in Massachusetts compared to our Roman alphabet and compared to the alphabet of Southern Spain. Let's see, on my left, you can see that I can't see the picture myself. I have to make sure it's in focus. You can see that the letters are similar. Quite similar. I like the X, which for us is the letter D. See, I see the picture backward on my screen but they are quite similar, in some cases identical. I like the bottom one, it looks like a bird's foot, but it's the letter T. The Greeks used that form, by the way, the ancient Greeks, the Greeks of, of New Testament times, that uh, bird's foot, that's, what they called PC, we often call it PSI, P-S-I. It's how we get these words like psychology that start with the letter P, but we pronounce only the S because frankly, it's hard to say psychology, but some Europeans still say it that way because that's how the Greeks said it. Oh, Oswald, you can't see the pictures? Um, I don't know why. Let's put the book up in front of the uh, camera again. This alphabet, Roman, Massachusetts. What the heck? Massachusetts and Southern Spain. Can you see them now? Oh, you can see them. Uh, okay, well, it never hurts to have pictures up as long as possible because I've noticed when I'm watching a YouTube video, people, the, the um, what do I call them, broadcasters? The people doing the videos rarely hold up pictures especially writing, but even pictures, long enough for me to get a handle on the image. So anyway, the writing in Greek, I want to point out, goes way back at least to um, 300 BC, to between 300 and 200 BC, when the scribes in Alexandria, Egypt, Hebrew scribes were translating the Old Testament in, or what we call the Old Testament, into Greek because so many uh, I don't want to call them Jews who were Hebrews or Israelites, no longer knew, could not read Hebrew. And of course, since Alexander had conquered uh, pretty much the known world, including Egypt and uh, Persia, 
and of course Greece. He conquered Greece. He was Macedonian, not Greek. Anyway, he had everyone learning to speak, read, and write Greek. And the Greek alphabet is really interesting. It didn't start out with these um, fancy letters that we see in a Greek New Testament or a Greek Hebrew Bible. They started out much like these inscriptions that we find in the Americas. Now, the thing about Celtic, and this always um, fascinates me, uh, rice, R-H-Y-S, um, wrote all kinds of stuff about Celtic language and the Arthurian legend and so forth. <clears throat> One of the tasks Rice set himself at the outset of his career was to determine, if he could, the relationships between the various Celtic languages, more than one. Sort of like English, we have uh, Australia and New Zealand, American English, British English, the Irish and the Scots don't speak the same as the English and the Welsh don't speak the same. The Cornish have their own dialect and the dialect of Southern England is different from the dialect of Northern England. And then we have Canadians. The English language, oh, and in the uh, Pacific Islands, people who speak English don't speak the same English we do. Same with the Celts in ancient times. So here's Rice trying to determine the relationships between different Celtic languages. <clears throat> this he did by comparative linguistics. And he set out his main conclusions in a book on Welsh philology published in 1877. There are tables in the book and blah, blah, blah. Rice's method was etymological. That is to say, he tabulated side by side similar words with similar or identical meanings in all the Celtic languages for which he had any information. He soon discovered that he could group the Celtic tongues into two large divisions, which he called the Q-Celts and the P-Celts. Languages of the Q group substitute Q, K, or CH in numerous words, where languages of the P group have either a P or a B. It is interesting to note that Q Celtic is analogous to Latin in this regard, whereas P Celtic is comparable rather to the Greek. Now, I'm not sure whether, yes, um, very fell includes a table, but it's so tiny that um, I, I just can't show it to you, it, you won't be able to read it. Oh, and he uh, mentions the Manx language of the Isle of Man, where Manx cats come from. It's also a different German scholars, meanwhile, had been investigating the interrelationships between the various languages spoken in Europe and Asia. These studies led to the recognition of the Indo-European or Aryan family of related languages in which Celtic was now recognized as comprising sister tongues of the better known branches of the family, namely Teutonic, which is English, Scandinavian, and German tongues, Italic, the extinct tongues of Northern Italy, including 
dialects very close to Gaulish, and the extinct Latin of Rome with its Romance descendants, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian. So there's a lot of Italic tongues. And um, the Greek dialects, the Slav branch with Russian, Bulgarian, Slovene, Czech, and others, and the various Eastern branches, including the Iranian and Indian divisions, of which Old Persian and Sanskrit present close parallels to Greek, Latin, and Celtic. So all of our languages in uh, the European uh, continent seem to have some relationship to each other. Whereas they claim that uh, the Asian languages are quite different, but I don't know about that. When I hear people speak Japanese, even though I can't read it because I don't know their um, pictograms. When I hear them speak it, it sounds like Spanish to my ear. Chinese, a little different. Chinese involves singing, and we think that we don't do that. But when we ask a question... Our voice rises in pitch. When we make a statement, it goes down. And when we're really angry, it gets really loud and can be either high or low pitched. That's when you tell a dog to sit. Or if your dog's biting you, stop! <laughs> we do sing when we speak. We just don't think of it that way. But in Chinese, the same sounds with a different melody, quite different meanings. Well, I have two whole listeners. I guess most of you are enjoying your Saturday morning in sunshine. Well, I'm all overcast with occasional snow flurries. Such is mountain life. I love the snow, but I don't want to go out in it again. I did that a little earlier for a very brief video. Um, our languages, I love languages. It's my thing. Ah, most of my listeners actually listen on the um, replay. They have lives, but I seem to have two listeners now. That's good. Feel free to join the chat. Let's see. I've been on for three quarters of an hour. I want to do more on Barry Fell. Now, at, in 1976, these were as astonishing new discoveries. Ah, here we go. Here's some African writing. We have in our familiar Roman or Latin letters, and then the style of Tunisia and Numidia, the style of settlers of Iowa, the state of Iowa here in the US, and the style of Libyan voyagers in the Pacific, the ancient Maori who, of course, are the people of New Zealand, the indigenous native peoples. So here's, once again, the letter T looks like an X. On my right, I have to see the picture on the screen and make sure you can see it. Oh, come on. Here we go. The very bottom one is the X, sometimes a cross. Looks like a T. It is a T. 
The one that looks like M, as in mother, is actually G. Isn't that interesting? Oops, lost my Hershey bar. The one that looks like our letter U is an M, as in mother. Very, very cool. You really need this book. Sadly, since Barry Fell is no longer living, he won't get any royalties. But I'm pretty sure his uh, descendants will. I can't smoke a cigarette because they keep going out. I smoke like a smokestack, but you know what? I don't drink, do drugs, I don't party, I almost never eat out, I don't have a car, so allow me this one sinful, guilty pleasure. Smoking cigarettes while drinking coffee. If you leave the cat hair from the floor on the Hershey bar, it might look like an ancient cuneiform artifact. Well, fortunately, it didn't land on the floor. My chocolate bar just landed in my lap. I'm very lucky. <clears throat> now, so these Zuni and so forth, I lost my page. are African styles of writing. And then we have the style of Syria and Lebanon, the original Phoenicia from 800 to 600 BC. Punic settlers of Iowa in 800 to 600 BC. <coughs> and Punic settlers of Spain, also 800 to 600 BC, and their letter T once again resembles the Greek psi, PSI. Yeah, I always think pounds per square inch. And I'll show you the picture in a minute. The M has finally come to represent, to resemble an M or a W. The T has become more like ah, an astronomical depiction of the sun or some other astronomical body. Here we go. So we have from left to right, Lebanon and Syria, Iowa, and then Spain. And let's see. The letter T is that uh, uh, far left is a square with a cross inside. In the middle, I don't know what to call that. A loopity loopity. And then uh, on the far right, uh, it looks to me like a flask with a worm in it, but it's the letter T. Now, usually in rock writing, when you see a square or a circle with that T inside, it represents the sun. Uh, it's amazing. You need this book. And then we have Egyptian, which is really complex. And it's, again, too small to really show it properly on the screen here. Well, Oswald knows what the middle one is, but um, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you can read it in the chat. 
but he could be right. So maybe the one on the far right is an egg. You know, uh, the ovum. And it appears to be fertilized. We have all kinds of people from all over the world in the Americas. Now remember, we think of Celts as um, English and French, but they started out uh, more to the south. And let's see. He doesn't really go into Asian settlement because that's been covered by the traditional settled academic historians. But I want to show you Mystery Hill, 81. So this focuses on African and European settlers in the Americas. Mystery Hill, Chapter 7, 7. By the beginning of May 1975, that's when I was still in uh, college. I think that's when I took a term, a semester off. By the beginning of May 1975, several signs began to warn us that there was a faint but real possibility that we might be on the verge of solving the most baffling problem of American archaeology, namely the identity of the builders of the mysterious root cellars of the northeastern states and the date of their occupation. These signs were, and he lists three, One, the so-called root cellars appeared to be the work of megalithic people. That is, they resembled corresponding structures in Europe dating from the Bronze Age and known to have been in use by the Celts in classical times. Two, we now knew that Celtic inscriptions occur in Spain and Portugal associated with Iberian Punic inscriptions and in the vicinity of megalithic structures. Three, Iberian Punic inscriptions were identified by me, that's very well, not me, me, at sites near Boston to which I was taken by James Whittall. These inscriptions, see page 89, appeared to be the work of casual voyagers visiting America during the era of about 500 to 300 BC. So <coughs> let's look at page 89. There is the archaeologist James P. Whittall II with the Mill River Steel. Uh, steel is a big rock with writing on it near Boston, the inscription in ancient Iberian letters warns passers-by not to loiter at the site. No, not to loiter as the site is a burial ground. Recently, a steel with a similar inscription was excavated from an ancient cemetery near Cudade de Pego in Portugal. So let's, here's Whittle with the inscription that he found near Boston. There's on my left, Whittall and the inscription on the rock. It's kind of hard to see. There, here we go. You can make out some of the letters. Uh, okay. Now let's go back to the text. Although my researches up to this time had been related to inscriptions of Europe and the Far East, James Whittle perceived that the parallels between the archaeological settings in New England and in Western Europe 
were now much clearer than had previously been realized. He now began to show me the files of photographs taken by Malcolm B. Pearson over the previous 35 years. So apparently Pearson started around 1940 taking photographs of inscriptions in the Americas. Okay, his photographs of um, illustrating the principal features of the so-called root cellars and other apparently megalithic structures. In company with Professor Norman Totten, chairman of the Department of History at Bentley College, we studied these and pored over every detail we could make out searching for traces of Ogham or other lettering that might be that might disclose if any Celtic occupation had occurred. None could be detected. Reluctantly, I had to tell Jim that unless there were inscriptions, I could throw no light on the problem. Nonetheless, despite these discouraging results, J Jim Woodall and I visited the best known of the sites on June 14. This is Mystery Hill, New Hampshire, a complex of stone slab chambers associated or oh, and associated hinge stones oriented so that the sun sets behind particular standing stones on the days of the equinox and the summer and winter solstices. The site covers approximately 60 acres, mostly occupied by second growth woodland through which run peculiarly constructed dry stone walls with tall pointed triangular stones occurring at regular intervals in the walls. It includes an area of about one acre covered by a maze of massive stone chambers with various other striking but puzzling features, such as the so-called table of sacrifice. So, oh, I got a new subscriber. Kev T is here. Thank you. I have three whole listeners. Trust me, many more the replay. They'll miss out on the chat. And for me, it's the chat. Oh, dear. And you're all young pups. Liam McVeigh is here, and he wasn't even born. Wow. That's a great Irish name, by the way, Liam McVeigh. I'm the enemy. I'm of Scott's ancestry. I'm Clan Morrison, same as John Wayne. <laughs> My ancestors stopped off in Ireland on their way to the United States, but they were Scottish. Scots-Irish, they called them. Actually, probably very closely related, Irish and Scots. They're Celtic. But they spoke slightly different dialects. And the Scots were a little more successful in uh, fighting back against the English invaders, those Britons. Who weren't, you know, England isn't really English. The Angles are pretty much gone. They're all Britons. Viking invaders. We can thank William the Bastard known as William the Conqueror. He was actually a Viking invader in southwestern France, who, uh, well, he was the son of, of the invader, and he wanted to make a name for himself. So from Brittany, which uh, is in France, but England considered it part of Britain, they fought and fought and fought, and William finally conquered England. <laughs> uh, he spoke French, and he made everybody learn French. 
but it was not the French of today. It was pronounced quite differently. And if, if you want to know more, study, read books, please. Okay. Mystery Hill, when they show it to you in documentaries, they show you a very tiny portion of it. They don't show you all these acres and acres of land with stone fences and monuments that we don't understand. And I don't think Bell has many photos of it, but he describes it. Some of the slab chambers reminded me of the Dunani, little fortresses of the ancient Goidelic Celts that I had studied in Scotland many years before. I was struck by the occurrence all over the site of flat flagstones of triangular outline, and I had to look up flagstones because I, I keep forgetting. Flagstone is not a particular mineral rock. It's a big flat rock of whatever composition. Could be granite, could be limestone, could be anything. Basalt, um, diorite. Well, anyway. Oh, and marble. Love marble. Uh, let's see. I was struck by the occurrence all over the site of flat flagstones of triangular outline, and these reminded me of the triangular slabs I had seen set above the lintels of dunans in northern Scotland. Although the things that I was shown that day by Robert Stone, the present owner and devoted protector of the site, made a profound impression on me, the one feature for which I was particularly alerted was, of course, whether or not any inscriptions had been found at Mystery Hill. Oh, Liam is making peace with the Scottish. And Kev has, Kev's girlfriend is a Morris. Am I familiar with well, my... Uh, let me see. My chat got cut off. Paul Kingsnorth. He wrote a novel called The Wake about ancient real Angle land. Pagan. No, I'm not familiar with um, Paul Kingsnorth, but I'll certainly look him up. And yes, Kev points out that you can find these old writings all over Wales, which, by the way, they, the Welsh really do consider themselves a separate nation and people from the English. But their language is dying out because the English kind of force everyone to speak English. Ah. John Michael Greer of the Arch Druid Report blog has a great book on the Colbrin or Sealbrin alphabet. Colbrin. Oh, the Colbrin Bible. Yeah, uh, the Colbrin Bible uh, has fallen into disrepute. K O L B R I N. Uh, Apparently, they kind of changed some of the translations to fit their doctrine. Often happens. Yes, Welsh is being suppressed by the English. The Scottish, like, um, oh, that heartthrob at any age. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of a famous actor. Uh, 007. Um, the Scottish one. Ah, well. They, the Scots now speak with their accent, but they're speaking English, not Celtic. Ireland is doing a better job of preserving the Celtic language. Cornwall, the Cornish, 
almost nobody speaks Cornish anymore, except on those little islands off the coast. You know, Cornish, Cornwall, White Cliffs of Dover, all that stuff. Well, anyway, let's see. He wants to know about inscriptions. It now turned out that such had indeed been found and fortunately preserved in the museum on the site, but it had not been realized that the strangely marked stones carried anything that could be read as writing. Writing it certainly was that I saw before me, not the Celtic script I had hoped for, but severely weathered Iberian Punic script. So that would be Phoenician, Spanish, Spanish Phoenician writing. But before I refer to these, I should here interpolate some short outline of the history of the site as an archaeological object. Well, we can skip that because there are so many documentaries and I want you to buy the book. For a long time, Mystery Hill was just plain ignored, even suppressed. Here's some photographs of Mystery Hill. So I have to, I have to tilt the book because I see lighting in this room. And I can't freaking see the screen. Here we go. And there. There's two photos here. Some kind of cave, man made cave. And I don't know, piled up blocks. Let's see what he says. Small megalithic chamber and two methods of roof construction employed. is a huge slab and the other is a bunch of corbelled corbelled roofing. Look it up. It's a whole bunch of smaller slabs. Now uh, let's see. The ships of Tarshish if you're into the New Testament, you know that Paul believed that he, his ministry would end when he reached Tarshish and that God would not let him die or be killed before he got there. And to him, Tarshish was probably Spain. But they knew about England and it could refer to England because... Um, England was also known as Tarshish. It was the place where they mined tin. Uh, see you later, Oswald. Come back for the replay. The um, people of the Mediterranean needed tin to make their various alloyed metals. Well, anyway, the ships of Tarshish. Let's see if I can find the beginning of the chapter. Well, heck with the beginning. Here's where he does mention China. There was a letter found. Come on. actually inscribed on a rock oh i'm sorry it's thus it was that in 1973 i was able to decipher the following letter written on sheets of gold leaf by hiram lord of tyre the language is etruscan as he is writing to a king of lavinia near Rome. The letter was excavated at Pergi, Italy in 1964. Skipping a little, the script that is that used in the Greek states of Italy 
in Sicily and in Etruria itself. A minor variant of the Phoenician alphabet in which vowels are introduced where the clarity of the text requires it. The date of the script is estimated by Italian archaeologists as about 550 BC, an estimate that is confirmed by the content of the document for Hiram reign from 553 to 533 BC. So this was found in Italy. But let's see what the letter says. I'm skipping. It would appear from this letter that the ambassador Kurbar must have been the owner of the vessel, that's a ship, since reference is made to his profit, which would have to be derived from the charge levied upon Hiram for carrying and delivering the cargo. The fine, as the letter makes clear, in the event of non-compliance with the terms of the contract, would be levied in addition to forfeiture of his normal profit. A similar ambassadorship may well have been accorded any voyager of good reputation and adequate financial resources <coughs> who happened <coughs> sorry, who happened to announce that he was about to visit a faraway land. This would explain why the Chinese Han court records, for example, refer to Roman embassies in the second century AD, though the Roman records themselves make no reference to such ambassadors. They tell us that Marco Polo, ha, yes, Kev, just, Joseph of Arimathea came to England for tin, Jesus' uncle. Yes, that's correct. The validity of the Han court's rec Han court, that's China, by the way, records is unimpeachable for the recorded dates and the name of the Roman emperor, as given in the Chinese archives, precisely match the Western records. Here now is a different type of shipping contract between a Greek merchant named Macarios and a skipper of Cadiz, that's Spain, near Nara, Cadiz, a city in Spain, both of whom have signed the contract on the back. It was found near Sereta de Alcoy, Spain, and consists of a lead lamina written on both sides. It is a curious fact that even at the early date, its script implies, about the 6th century BC, the conditions less favorable to the hirer are set out in smaller print on the back of the contract. The alphabet employed here is Greek, but the language of the contract is Phoenician. Blah, 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 blah. In any case, These are contracts to carry cargo to a distant land at a time when supposedly uh, people were afraid to even enter the Atlantic Ocean when they must do so to reach parts of Africa and <coughs> Northern Europe. They hug the coastline. <clears throat> because there are dragons in that ocean and huge waves and so forth. Horse pucky. An Eskimo's kayak is more seaworthy than the wash tubs that Columbus had. In any case, ancient people traveled the world. As, as you'll hear quite often now, the ocean is not a barrier, it's a highway. Would you rather walk across the Aleutian Peninsula during the Ice Age when the Bering Strait was all dry land, a land bridge? 
or sit in a boat and let the wind and waves carry you across. Now, either way, you need provisions, you need food, clothing, shelter, all the necessities. But isn't it easier to put them in the uh, cargo of a ship than to carry them on your back and walk for hundreds and maybe thousands of miles? Really amazing. Amazing, amazing. Let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see. A little more. Um, the Celtic Sea Power. Chapter. Uh, nine. Page 112. The Celts and the Druids were all over North America and possibly South America, too. <clears throat> the rise and fall of Celtic sea power has been so strangely neglected by most historians and archaeologists as to prompt much skepticism when I first began to report Celtic inscriptions in America. I can't say I ever heard that the Celts were seafarers was a typical comment. Those who recall that Julius Caesar described the ancient Britons as mostly naked savages, wearing only iron toques about their necks, sometimes with the skin of a beast cast over the shoulders, think of the Britons as having nothing better than one-man coracles for crossing water. A coracle is basically a, a soup bowl big enough to sit in. It's round. Oh, I hear the trash truck outside. Okay, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, most of book three of Caesar's, you know, Julius Caesar, De Bello Gallico is devoted to the greatest na naval battery. He, I don't know, my brain's slower than my tongue. Is devoted to the greatest naval battle he was ever called upon to mount. And his adversaries, none other than the Celts of Brittany, whose fleet was swelled by the arrival of a flotilla they had a summoned from their allies in Britain. The combined Gallic and British naval armament comprised an immensely powerful force, numbering, so Caesar tells us, no less than 220 ships, all larger than and superior in construction to those of the opposing Roman navy under Admiral Brutus. These Celtic ships, Caesar says, were so soundly constructed that they could outride tempestuous or contrary winds upon the very ocean itself without sustaining injury. It is clear that these fine vessels, which towered over the Roman galleys, had the capability of crossing the Atlantic Ocean upon the vast open sea as Caesar indicates. But who were the Celts to which Caesar refers? And how did they come to be in possession of such naval might? To answer that question, let me retrace the steps of my own inquiry into the background of the Roman observer's commentary on the events of 55 BC. Sorry, I had to turn off that heating pad that I'm sitting on. It's actually warm now. And again, buy the book. I don't make any money on it. I just love this book. And skipping away so, uh, so I now learned to my surprise that unlike the Gauls of the interior, 
Several of the tribes that inhabited the coastal lands of northern France were skilled sailors whose chieftains were united in a maritime alliance under the leadership of the Veneti of Brittany. Caesar lists these maritime Celts, and they include the Veneti themselves of Armorica, together with their neighbors, the Curiosolites of the Channel Coast, the Veneli of the Channel Islands, and the Cherbourg region, the Namnetes of Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S, and further south, the Pictones and Santones of the Bay of Biscay coastlands, as well as the Lexovii of Normandy. Caesar further mentions that when the battle was looming up, the Veneti also summoned allies from among the tribes of Britannia. These then were the Celts, whose combined resources placed a fleet of 220 ships off the estuary of the Loire, L-O-I-R-E, it's a river in France, ready to do battle against the might of Rome early in the summer of 55 BC. I'll skip a little bit. The Roman triremes and biremes lay low in the water, deep keeled and helpless in the shallow waters. The Celtic ships towered high above them on flat keels that made them maneuverable in the estuary. Although a keel prevents a ship from drifting before the wind, it is not in fact a necessary feature. No one denies the ocean-going capability of the Viking ships, but their, yet their exhumed remains show them to have been flat-bottomed. The Celtic vessels had tall masts and yards, and skipping a little. <coughs> So, in this dangerous situation, the forethought of Brutus had seen to it that an appropriate secret weapon had been taken aboard the Roman ships. Knowing themselves to be poor sailors, no match for the Carthaginians during the Punic Wars, the Romans had long ago invented the grappling iron to lay hold on the enemy so he could be boarded and defeated as in a land engagement. And skipping a bit, faced by the certainty of being outmaneuvered by this new strategy, the Celtic admiral, whose name is not given, ordered his ships to withdraw from the engagement. At this juncture, narrative, <coughs> sorry, at this juncture, nature came to the aid of the Romans. The wind suddenly dropped, leaving the Celtic fleet becalmed without means of propulsion. Admiral Brutus seized his chance, ordering the grappling irons thrown, and the battle now reverted to the Roman specialty, hand-to-hand -hand combat on stationary decks. The entire Celtic fleet was destroyed or captured, while the Romans still had 80 serviceable ships, with which Caesar later, in September of 55 BC, carried the war across the channel to Britannia. So, don't think our ancient ancestors couldn't cross the Atlantic Ocean. It's actually... Uh, not only narrower, but also calmer than the Pacific. So uh, maybe it was easier to cross between Siberia and Alaska on a land bridge than in a ship. But um, where the Atlantic Ocean is concerned, especially if you can either take advantage of the Gulf Stream current or hop 
do some highland hopping around Greenland and Iceland. The ship is the way to go, the ocean going ship. And it's always fascinated me that the Europeans, the modern Europeans, could not match the seaworthiness of ancient Viking ships. Phoenician ships. Do you know that at one time the Phoenicians were the masters of the Mediterranean? They were the best sailors. And they did trade with, you know, go around, buy something here, sell it there, etc. But they were also kind of pirates. In fact, uh, the Marine Hymn, when it talks about the shores of Tripoli, that has to do with uh, modern-day Phoenician pirates <laughs> of North Africa. Look it up. I don't remember the details. The Barbary Coast pirates. So, from ancient times to modern times, the Phoenicians and their descendants have engaged in piracy, plundering and pillaging, as well as trading. But, of course, once the Romans defeated Hannibal and burned Carthage to the ground, the Romans became masters of the Mediterranean. And if it had not been for a fluke of the weather, the dying down of the wind, all of the Mediterranean world would have been Celtic, under Celtic rule. North Africa, the Middle East, Southern Europe, Italy, Greece, Eastern Europe, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, all of those. Just a fluke, chance occurrence. Well, folks, um, I'm going to end this here, but please do buy America BC by Dr. Barry Fell and have a great day. Well, I figure out, uh, oh, here it says end stream. That's how I end it. Let's see. I'll try to talk and Type at the same time and type, thank you all for listening. And I'll be back, I don't know when, soon, I hope. Ah, love and hugs. Let's see. Um, okay, I don't know how to do this. Let's see if this works. It works. Goodbye and God bless.